morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana. I am here to present or introduce Jeff Kuhn and uh, Jota Manrique. Um, let me talk to you about them a little. So Jeff, um, I just met him, but uh, not, not today. But um, I am very impressed with, with you because I would like um, to work um, as, a, as this immersive design lab in Ohio University as he works, right? Um, he also works with the faculty to integrate video games and immersive media into the classroom practice. Okay, so welcome, um, Jeff. We are very, very glad to have you here. And of course, um, Jota Manrique. Uh, good morning, Jota. How are you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so Jota is our CEO in Change and a co-founder co also. Um, he's changing language education in Peru, of course, and um, he has been in charge of innovating team. And thanks to him, of course, um, to his work, he was elected as a 2017 Fellow on, of the Young Leaders of American Initiative a program sponsored by the, the Department of State of the U.S. All right, so welcome, Jota and uh, Jeff. Welcome, uh, Michael, too. Um, and we can start with our presentation today. Thanks, Diane, for the introductions. And as Hoda mentioned, you know, we're kind of taking this as a two-parter where you know, today we'll be doing some kind of big picture things, kind of big general themes that we can use. And, and we're going to cover you know, kind of five ideas over the course of the hour. And it's not that those ideas have to all be taken together, but you might be able to take one of those ideas and implement them in the classroom or take one of those ideas that you do really well in the class and share it with the rest of the group here today. And then tomorrow in HOTA session, we're going to get a little more hands on a little more kind of practical with with some of these things and, and what we can do to really um, change up the way we think about designing our courses you know um, part of my work at my university has been doing instructional design with faculty across all sorts of disciplines and you know i i'll say right off the start i think language teachers have always been uh, a little more on the cutting edge with a lot of different pedagogy and practices so, you know, definitely share, you know, the ideas that you have today, you know, if there's something you already do, something you, you, you know, like to do more, uh, you know, tell us in the chat, you know, we'll have time for, for kind of questions and conversations over the course of the hour too. So, um, you know, feel free to jump in and, and try out some of these things, discuss the things, argue some of these things as well, as I, as I kind of go through the session and, uh, I'm going to share my screen here and we'll see how this goes. Let me know if everybody can see that. Um, so this is, you know, what I, I kind of have summed up in life. Everything I know about course design, I learned from playing video games. And, you know, I think it um, really kind of is more about how do we shift from a traditional way of thinking about designing courses to something that's a little more flexible, something a little more interactive, um, that we've had to adjust to and adapt to with life over the last two years. And, you know, what are our classes going to look like, you know, moving forward? You know, we talk about going back to normal or, you know, moving beyond the screen. Um, what does it look like? So how do we take some of the things maybe we learned about um, online learning and bring them into our face-to-face -face classrooms? What are the things about face-to-face -face that we can do better with, you um, online learning. So we'll kind of hit all these little topics as we go through things here. So uh, let's, let's get started with it. Enough talking from me. So if we go over and, you know, we kind of think about our first question, throw your ideas in the chat, you know, just something to think about as we talk. Um, what experiences or, you know, insight over the past two years has altered your approach to teaching? Um, you know, reflecting back on how things used to be done, you know, um, before we went mostly online, what's changed and what do you think you're going to carry with you moving forward? You know, when we go back into our face-to-face -face classrooms or we continue to do a hybrid or a, 
you know, blended model of, of online and face-to-face -face learning, what are those practices you're going to keep? Um, so for me, the five practices that I've outlined here today are the, the ones that I'm going to keep. So I'd really love to hear what everyone else is thinking as well. So uh, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, Santa says to deliver classes online. We've got that quite a bit. A lot of students um, in our university, it's been interesting. You know, we're, we're getting back to face-to-face to -face pretty quickly, um, but they still don't want to come back face-to-face. -face. They want to do everything online. You know, we have a lot of folks who say, I really like the online format, and I just don't want to leave it. So how do we make those accommodations to students? So, you know, thinking about that, you know, one of the big ideas here that we're really kind of tackling is just this notion of learner-centered design. You know, how do we think about our classes as no longer being content centric you know where here's the content i have to cover i have to get this done today because we have a quiz at the end of the week how do we shift from that traditional model of course development to something that's a little more you know learner centered and it's it's really difficult because often those things aren't in our control we might have a state government that decides what we teach and how we teach it we might have a school district that decides or we might teach a class as part of other classes. So I understand that this isn't something, you know, that we alone as educators can change, but as more of us think about these things and play with these ideas, the more that we're gonna start to see things um, change a little bit. You know, as, as Santa says down there, I'm not good at technology, but learning step-by-step, step, that's fine. You know, I think one of the, the critical pieces here is we often think about, you know, technology as this, thing that we have to use, but good learning design principles are um, independent of technology. You know, we can think about them differently and we can um, have these ideas in place and it'll help us think about technology in a, in a little bit more of a concrete way for our class. And, you know, talking about this learner-centered design, I really like this quote from Shoot, Rybert, and Van Eck that says, Instructional environments should be interactive, provide ongoing feedback, grab and sustain attention. Those are all the features of a really good game. And so that's kind of what we're talking about today a little bit of, you know, how do we give students more agency so they're getting more interaction from the class? Um, very much we can steal ideas from video games. So if you love video games, this is a talk for you. If you don't like video games, you don't need to be an expert in them to get something out of this talk as well. So my first big thing I always recommend, kind of my first um, theme of this is, how do we use landmarks uh, to guide learners? Because this is something that you know we'll see in, um, in games, and we see in really good course design, but often we don't see it in the day-to-day -day course design of, of classes. You know, um, I like to call this the uh, the town square problem. You know, when I'm working with faculty about building a class and designing their course, I'll say, um, where's your town square? And what I mean is, you know, if you go to South America, you go to Europe, um, there's always a, a town square where people go to congregate and gather. So if I'm looking for someone or I'm looking for something to do, I may stop at the town square first. So. Where in your class do students go first to get the information they need? You know, as we, we go out online, we might be using Zoom and Canvas. We might have students putting documents into OneDrive or Google Docs, or they might be using something like VoiceThread or Panopto or some of these other technologies out there. Um, and the class starts to look really the same, really monotonous, and they can't quite tell where anything should be. Um, and this is one of these problems of user-centered design. We know what we're trying to accomplish in our, our course design, but the, from a user's perspective who doesn't have the expert knowledge we do, everything can just sort of look all the same and it starts to get really hard to know where we are. You can get lost easily. Um, you know, thinking about things about where things go in our course and how things should be labeled. What's the critical information that, you know, our player in the sense or our student really needs to have. So um, always thinking about that first as we start to design out our course, like how is my course going to be organized in ways that are highly visible and that make sense? Am I using, you know, little simple things 
Uh, my favorite example of this is Disney World. Although Disney World's not a video game, um, I like to show faculty this map. And I say, you know, if you go to Disney World, there's always a big building in the center of each place where you can look at it and you know exactly where you are. Oh, there's the Magic Castle, so I know where I am because the Magic Castle is over there. And there's there's Epcot over there. So I know where I am in relation to everything else. Uh, you see this a lot in game. And, you know, thinking about that with our classes and our course design, it's making it very clear to our students, where do we go? Where are we going next? How are we going to get there? And what do I need to do to get there? So everything from, you know, clearly labeling, what is it that you're studying? You know, very clear schedules, very clear timelines. If you have questions, go here. If you need help, go here. Um, and, you know, part of that really comes down to having clear, strong verbs in our in our online course material. And I'm sure some of you are seeing this and saying, well, of course we do this, Jeff. Um, and again, I think it's language teachers. We've always been a little bit more ahead of the game. But I see this in a lot of more general education where um, the faculty don't think in the, the teachers don't think in strong verbs, you know, have students watch this, read this. Um, it's kind of another part of this is I like to say, um, always be thinking about what are my students doing? Um, not what do they need to learn, but what are my students doing? Oh, they're going to read this. They're going to watch this. They're going to apply this information. Um, it can really start to help organize and give our class a structure that makes it easier to follow. Students know exactly where they are and exactly what they should be doing. Um, so kind of, you know, keeping that in mind, there's lots of great rubrics out there. My university uses Blackboard. So um, I've got that example here, but there's a lot of great rubrics out there that you can use to grade your own online class by looking at, you know, here are the things a good course should have in it. And you can kind of check your course against those um, for that organization and that structure, that, you know, level design, if we think about it in terms of video games. You know, do you have a clear and can clean level design in your, your course? Um, you know, and so I think about that, you know, for me, I learned that during our last two years online, how to develop a really clean, clear online course. So that was, for me, was the biggest change that I made as an educator, was thinking about what do my students know about this information and is it easy for them to get lost or can they find their way through it easily? So my question for everybody in the chat there is uh, what changes would you make to your online or face-to-face -face or teaching content that you think will provide more clarity for your students? What have you changed uh, to make it easier for your students to navigate your, your online or your, um, you know, hybrid courses? So, you know, feel free to jump in the chat and, and drop your ideas in there as we kind of we talk some of these ideas through. Uh, Santa's in there again saying include websites and videos to make my classes. Yeah, you know, having just those little videos can really make a difference. You know, students respond well to imagery. So if we just have all writing, all text in our online class, it can be um, really confusing. But even just using imagery and videos can really help kind of clean things up. I think that's a great answer. Others out there? We'll see as people are coming through the door. Maybe we'll pick up steam in the back half. But, you know, yeah, Arturo's in there saying videos help a lot. They really do. They provide that little more interactivity, a little more clarity for our class. Um, so th these are kind of those examples we want to think about. Rachel says, trying to have the same amount of resources or clicks. Yeah. Um, I like to say more than three clicks to get to something, your student's not going to do it. Um, so how do we keep things really kind of clear and not too much clicking through. Yvonne says, I use UBD when I plan my events. What is UBD? I'll have to see what, what that is. Um, and while we do, as we get some clarity on that, I'm curious to know, I want to learn. Uh, let's go into our next area here, which really is just uh, what I like to call short-term objectives and long-term goals. Uh, this is something that video games do really well. You got to get through level one, one, uh, get to the castle. Well, why? To save the princess in Super Mario Brothers. You know, little things like that. Oh, understanding by design. All right, cool. All right. We're on to something here. 
Uh, so really kind of thinking about this part about, you know, what is it that students, again, so they don't get lost. It's like, why am I doing this in terms of the overall class? So what is it that we're doing today? And why is that important with the overall uh, approach to the class? You know, and I think this is something where as, as educators, you know, we often think about a goal for our class, you know, it might be something very broad. Like I want my students to be more effective communicators or I want them to think critically. Um, but how do we tighten that up? How do we make sure there's a really clear um, implementation of that? So again, it's so students understand what it is they're going to do. So how do we get beyond to sort of these vague goals of, I want my students to be more effective communicators in English. Um, and think more about what it is concretely they need to do today in order to make them successful at the end of the semester. So, you know, we think about this in terms of traditional design. You know, we talk about traditional design where it's often been, here's my content, here's my book. You know, we're going to use this textbooks in, in class. So now, mm, all right, well, here's going to be my homework. All right, this will be my quiz. and hey, students will pass the class. You know, thinking about that where we put content first versus the goal of the class first um, is a really important kind of switch. And so, you know, Yvonne says we have to plan backwards. Yvonne's on top of this, knows what's going on. We talk about backward design is a really great kind of approach that we can think about. And it's something we'll, we'll get into a little bit more, uh, you know, tomorrow where it's, it's just a little more active learning where you think about what are the expectations um, how do we have evidence of that? And what do students need help with in order to do it? Um, so we kind of go through this, really break it down. We start with, well, by the end of this class, how will my students be different? Well, how will I know they have changed? So that final assessment where it's, I want them to change in this way, how will I know they have? And then of course, what are the learning outcomes per week or per module or per unit? say what must students be able to do or think in order to be successful in the assessment um, and then finally you know what do, do students need to achieve the learning objectives so kind of that backward design with you know start with our goal and then only at the end do we pick our um, book our content or you know our textbook or do we pick the technology um, yeah i think a lot of times the struggle we see generally speaking is when we start to use technology in the classroom we pick it first we say, i'm going to use this technology in the classroom i'm going to use this software well why what goal does it serve what purpose does it serve um it looks fun it looks engaging versus saying you know what technology best helps my students deliver a speech and thinking about again what are the things i want them to be able to do in my class um, versus, you know, again, the content. I sound like I'm repeating myself there, but it's a really critical difference. And it's something I think with Hota, we're gonna see uh, and talk about a little bit more tomorrow, you know. So if we think about that, you know, long-term goals, I like to say, you know, if I meet my student in five years, what do I want them to really remember about my class? That's my long-term goal. You know, I want them to learn to be effective public speakers, on a diverse range of topics. You know, what's that long-term goal? So what do I need to do to support them, to design my course, design my level, um, so they can complete this successfully? And, you know, this is where it's really important when we think about those long-term goals or, you know, kind of short-term objectives, um, really kind of boiling down exactly what we want the student to do. I always like to ask, you know, educators that I work with, what's your student doing in this activity? What's your student doing in this lesson? And how do we pick the, the strong verbs? You know, Bloom's taxonomy here, you know, if we use things like um, recall, repeat, or know, or understand, those are really kind of vague terms that don't generate a lot of student activity, but instead, can we have students um, assemble, construct, create, design, develop, formulate? So what is it that they're actively engaged in um, each step of the way. So, you know, by the end of our course, they almost have a portfolio of activity, all these actions they've done that show that, hey, I can do um, what 
I was asked to do and I have evidence of it that shows I can you know, meet that that long term goal. So, you know, working through these ideas of, of what are our smart, you know, learning objectives almost where we think about, you know, learning objectives, something like by the end of the unit, students will be able to categorize statements as either opinion or fact using a graphic organizer, then construct a one paragraph argument using only facts, something like that, where we very clearly have, you know, by when should students do this? Who's going to do it? The students, of course. What will they do? They're going to categorize. Where's that strong verb? And then how much? Just one paragraph and of what? A one paragraph of an argument. So kind of thinking about those, you know, very clear, uh, concise, you know, learning objectives that then we can, you know, use. So once we know that kind of clear, direct learning objective, we know exactly what kind of homework assignment we need to assign. We know exactly what content to pick that makes students successful in, in reaching that objective. So, you know, those those kind of um, really concrete goals there will help us, again, you know, move students into a position where they'll have a little more agency, have a little more activity in the class. And uh, I'm going to read through the chat here real quick, um, just to see if I can catch up. Uh, let's see here. Um, Monica says, I'd like to work with different technology resources because they offer creative ways to uh, to produce students' evidences. I think it's a great thing. You know, when we think about technology, what is that creativity that students get to show? You know, um, Julio says technology must, but at times it's books, CD players, and paper were used. Exactly. And I think this is what I really always like to stress about things that, that Julio is mentioning here. Um, good design doesn't need technology. You know, uh, in, in game development, we say if it's fun on paper, it'll be fun digitally. So we try to make something fun on paper. Um, so, you know, if your activity needs and absolutely requires technology, it may not be the best activity. But if it works without technology, chances are it is solid and technology will only enhance its effectiveness. You know, so... You know, I like to think about this too, where that can be really difficult when you think about learning outcomes or learning goals. And so how much flexibility and learning outcomes do you have in your local teaching context? Um, some classes I teach, I have lots of flexibility. Um, in others, I have no flexibility. You know, I must cover uh, the same material that other teachers are covering. So kind of something to think about there. What are your, your flexibilities in, in these sorts of things? Um, and so feel free to throw that into the chat if you're comfortable doing that. Thoughts so far? Questions? Arguments? Is everybody just bored? I hope not. Okay. All right. I'm sure Diana will tell me. She's like, Jeff. Um, the other thing I think about this too is once we have those, you know, we have that clear map of our class. When we talk about, you know, getting lost in a class like you know we have that clear map so students don't get lost and then we have those clear learning objectives so we know students are doing exactly this then we have this room for frequent feedback you know, something that that games do really well and I, I really found that um you know when we talk about games players get angry in a video game when they fail and they don't know why they failed um, and I always think that's interesting is that's what makes players angry when they fail and they don't know why. But often that happens in school. I might fail a quiz and I don't know exactly why I failed it because I don't get enough feedback. Um, you know, so games are really good at giving feedback, you know, quick, immediate feedback. And so that's something I always like recommend with with classes is how can we increase the level of feedback that our students get? And especially how can we make it so the feedback comes enough that students can make little mistakes along the way versus waiting for the big test and you know if you fail this there's there's lots of trouble but can we have small frequent feedback that lets students kind of fail safely um so we speak this is something that kolb talks about way back in 1984 it says you know real learning comes from action taking and seeing the consequences of that action um, in order to have those consequences, we definitely need to have the feedback. So what are ways that we can use maybe technology or just, you know, general good teaching methods to give our students more frequent feedback? 
you know, and there's lots of ways to do this. Um, even something simple like, you know, having our students write their papers on Google Docs or, you know, Microsoft OneDrive, for instance, they have revision history. So if my student's writing in a Google Doc, I can see all the changes they make in their paper. So instead of just getting a paper from a student after a week and I see their finished product, I could take a look at it maybe two or three times that week, look at the revision history and see what changes they made. We could start to see how our students are writing versus just the finished product. So even there where we switch from a paper-based approach to you know, something like Google Docs gives us a lot more opportunity for feedback. Um, you know, we can have conversations with our students through uh, the feedback system. You know, I like to tell my students when we're writing essays in class, if you have a question about the writing process, leave me a message. Um, so I can say, is this clear? I don't know how to write this sentence, teacher. Can you help me? Uh, so a lot of kind of the feedback tools are ways to have a little communication with our student where they can ask for help in, in context. Um, so those are kind of those frequent feedback things that we can use. Um, other examples there are things like Kahoot. Um, you know, I'm sure there's lots of quizzing software people use in their class, things like Quizlet or Kahoot. Um, you know, Microsoft Forms might be another one where we can almost augment our lectures or our class activities with little mini quizzes uh, for students. So we can ask our students a question and get real time results on what they know and, you know, start to say, well, wow, that last question, only two of my students got it correct and 12 got it wrong. I probably made some mistakes. I need to slow down. I need to fix this. I need to get this addressed before we move forward. Those are those kind of opportunities when we talk about frequent feedback where, you know, Kahoot seems like a really just fun little game, but it's actually a really powerful feedback mechanism that we can use. Um, you know, again, things like forms, you know, we can use Google forms or, you know, Microsoft forms, whatever option you have and see how many students responded what are the results? How many got them right? How many got them wrong? And so that feedback can help us inform our teaching and we can use it right there in class. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking about those little tiny ways that we can just do feedback that's, that's more, um, you know, formative assessment versus a big summative assessment at the end of a unit or at the end of a class semester. Because, you know, the other aspect of this with feedback, things like Kahoot or a, a Google survey or Google quiz is it can help break up, you know, class lectures. You know, we think about the, the average adult learner can take about 15 to 18 minutes of direct instruction before they just start to kind of like zone out. And, you know, we've lost them because um, lectures can be kind of long. You know, if we're talking for 30 minutes, we might lose our students. So instead, can we do a few minutes of a conversation, few minutes of a lecture, and then an assessment, some sort of quick feedback loop. Um, I like to think about a class where we break out our, our lectures. And again, this is something language teachers have always done really well. 10 to 12 minutes of covering content and then a quick activity. 10 to 12 minutes of a you know lecture or content and an activity. So can we put little feedback loops inside of those three to four minute activities? Um, and again, this is something where, you know, those digital tools like Kahoot or Google Quiz or, you know, Microsoft Forms can really help us get real time information about how our students are performing. So um, I'm seeing over there in the chat, you know, Sivan so says this way helps us to assess formally to our own students. Exactly. It helps us build out that information over the course of a of a semester and we can get all these little pieces of evidence. Um, so I'm kind of curious, you know, with everybody here in the, the chat, what tools have you used to provide student feedback? Um, what are things that you like to use so you know how students are doing over the course of a semester? You know, for me, my, my university uses a lot of Microsoft. For, for me, it's been a lot of Microsoft Forms, um, Microsoft Teams chats this semester. That's what I've been using. Another, another Teams user. Any others? Just maybe... Well, I use Kahoot. I use quizzes. 
um for formative i think is the call the other one and i remember it's a greek name also the other one Socrative, Socrative, yeah. i think something like that yeah yeah so formative assessment yeah um well there are other techniques that doesn't involve those those tools like basically uh i tend to provide feedback during the lesson a lot so the lesson is not a lecture like you're mentioning like you we have a, a lecture and then an activity and then students actually realize how much they have they have learned or how much they need to learn and then we adapt the pace according to if they already know something i don't need to re-explain things that they already know right so. we know exactly what they're doing you know and how well they're doing I'm seeing over there a, a Jamboard is one I've I've never used Jamboard, but I see it a lot. Uh, Mentimeter is great. That's another one for quick polling. Um, let's see there. Monica says Padlet. I really like Padlet for students to drop supplemental materials. Um, I've used Padlet in classes where I just say, hey, if you find something interesting on the Internet, like a video or a web link that helps us learn this topic better, drop it in the Padlet. And so it's a way to kind of crowdsource information. Um, we got, you know, let's see, Lenoi, Google Forms, Live Worksheets, um, WhatsApp, that's another one, WordWall, wow, lots of great ones over there. I love crowdsourcing tools because now everybody can kind of check these out and, and pick which one works best for you and your students. And so, you know, again, you know, kind of thinking always about that, that feedback. And then what I really like about having all of that feedback is this it gives us this opportunity to to affirm our students performance it, it helps us really understand at a day-by-day -day level how our students are doing and then give them that affirmation of performance and again this is something that as a as a lifelong video game player i was always used to like hey here's my score i know how well i'm doing the game told me i did this well or i didn't do this well i was always used to knowing exactly how i was doing in a game but when i would go to school like i'm not quite sure how i'm doing i'd get grades at the middle of the semester and i'd get a grade at the end of the semester but along the way i just had no idea um so how can we use that frequent feedback that we get through little quizzes and little interactive sessions during our class to help us affirm our students performance um, and this goes back to something that i really like from a book called what the best college teachers do by uh, ken bain Ken says, uh, you know, really kind of at the core of a lot of teaching is a focus on what the teacher does rather than what the students are supposed to learn. And, you know, I always, I found that really problematic for my own teaching. So I was like, that's exactly it. I'm focused on what I need to cover in my class, but not necessarily what my students need to do to become, you know, better people or, you know, more expert, you know, better experts in this field. So, you know, really kind of thinking about shifting that idea from what do I need to cover and what's my content to what do my students need to learn and how best can I support them? Um, you know, in making that shift, you know, we talk about things like the learning pyramid where if, you know, I'm lecturing, a person will remember about 5% of what they heard in a lecture. Um, you know, if I'm giving a demonstration, people will remember about 30% of that. But if someone's teaching another person, they'll retain about 90% of that information. So, you know, how can we shift kind of down the pyramid and do things that help students affirm their performance through experience and action taking? Um, can we have them doing, you know, more discussions? Can we have them practice doing things? Can we have them teaching other students? So, you know, active classroom strategies that we can implement in our class. Um, you know, and, and I think this is kind of an interesting idea of um, how do we create kind of these escalating challenges? You know, video games do this really well, where the first challenge is always easy. It's just, can you do it? The second talent challenge gets a little more difficult. The third challenge gets really difficult. But by then you've practiced enough. You've had enough practice, practice, practice that you can do it. Um, so how do we create situations in class where students get those little practice opportunities so you know when the big standardized test comes they have the practice they need um, or you know they've escalated up the challenges so they they feel comfortable and the curve of learning isn't too too steep 
And, you know, there's lots of ways we can do this. We have active learning, kind of, you know, process oriented or task based learning of, you know, what are the things that we can have our students doing? Um, and so part of that that I really like is, you know, with this affirmation of performance, you know, how can we show students doing things? How can we shift the, the way they do things? And then as a result, you know, give them multiple ways to solve a problem. Um, and again, you know, this is something that I've always, you know, been really fond of with video games is you can do, you know, you can solve a problem through six or seven different ways. You can just kind of go in different directions. Um, how can we do that in our class? You know, how can we have our learning objective and say, all right, well, here's the learning objective. A student could complete it like four different ways. How do I make it so students have that opportunity um, to kind of really diversify the way they approach something? Um, this goes back to, to Bain. It says, the very best teachers offer a balance of the systematic and the messy. And I really like this quote of, um, you know, really kind of thinking about with those lear learning objectives we write, you know, and saying, what is it that I really am asking my students to do? You know, um, the learning objective is, you know, they're going to write an argument, a one paragraph argument. Um, you know, I'm asking them to write something, but what I really want to know is, can they form an argument? So could they do a speech? Could they do a debate? Could they write the paper? So suddenly maybe I have three ways that my students could complete that learning objective instead of just writing the one paragraph argument. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking about these sorts of things of what are those active learning strategies where we could say, you know, you've got three or four options to complete this assignment. Are there ways to kind of diversify? Um, you know, and often this means a shift from a, uh, you know, A, B, C, D sort of grading system to something that's a little more rubric based, right? Where we say, you know, an effective assignment will have these features, you know, this will be you know, 10 points and this will be five points and this will be, you know, two points. Um, so can we shift from, you know, doing a quiz to something that's, you know, like a group evaluation or a case study or, you know, role playing. And again, you know, language learners and language teachers are, are familiar with these because these are often the three to four minute activities that we'll do in our class to really get students moving and active. Um, so kind of thinking about those, you know, in a little more, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? I run out of English, um, a little more holistic way that gives them um, an opportunity to try lots of different things. You know, I think um, throwing open the, the gate to letting students do lots of different things, um, it can be messy, but if we've got those clear learning objectives with those strong verbs in a clearly mapped out class where it's hard for students to get lost or confused, suddenly this doesn't seem as intimidating anymore. Because if you have eight or nine students doing very different projects as part of a homework assignment, but you say, hey, very clear learning objective. Can they meet that? Are they doing what I want them to do? Um, suddenly this isn't as intimidating. Suddenly it's a little easier to manage. Um, Vaughn says down there in the, in the chat, think pair share is my favorite when I ask them essential questions. Exactly. Um, I love think pair shares because it gives me a moment to organize my thoughts and then I get to kind of, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I'll ask Diana, we'll chat. Oh, we have the same idea and she's smart. Last, so, Hey, looks like I got, maybe I got the answer right. And then we can share it with the whole group and it's our idea we're sharing versus just mine. And so, you know, that's a really great one that, um, is really quick, really fast active learning strategy. And, you know, maybe students could draw a picture or they could, you know, uh, draw a chart or a graph or, you know, verbally explain something. So what are those ways that we can um, diversify the way our students present information to us? You know, one of my favorites that I really love doing in class is called a raft activity um, where you know, I give students a role, you know, have them um, address an audience in a particular format about a topic. So I might say, all right, you know, we're talking about recycling in this unit. So you're going to give a speech and you are a member of city council who makes decisions for the city. 
and you're going to address other city council members to get them to agree to your recycling program. You know, something like that where it's very clear, you know, oh, I know who I am, I know what I'm doing, I know why I'm doing this, and I know the topic that I'm doing it about. Um, really great little active learning strategy that can produce, you know, great results in our, in our class. Um, I like to put that one out there just because it's my favorite to do. Students often get really creative with it. You know, and so for me, that's my favorite kind of active learning strategy of those raft activities. Um, which ones do you like? So we know Yvonne mentioned think, pair, share. Uh, what are the ones that other people really like to use in class? See, peer correction and peer feedback is another good one. Any others? It could be in the chat, it could be in the microphone. Let us know. See a role play over there in the chat. So Santa's saying a role play activity. Well, if I can jump in, yeah. I don't know if we can actually say it's. I I use a lot of well, I mix a lot of task-based learning with project-based learning and problem-based learning. <laughs> so depending on the situation and all that, I use any of, some of them. But all of them have something in common, like there is a a mission that they that the students have to accomplish and there are activities that they actually have to do and complete and there is a clear objective that basically we decide with them and it's relevant so i don't know if that actually is considered an answer to your question number five. Oh, i like the idea that you call them missions i think that's super cool yeah i really think it is you know i see like eddie's putting class discussion and self-assessment on grammar topics you know um how well do you are you doing this? You know, um, Elias says debates, another great one, you know, um, brainstorming to get to their previous knowledge. You know, just those little things of, of having students kind of just share everything out. And, you know, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, frequent feedback and affirmation of performance where, you know, the more that students know that they can take a risk and if they fail, it's okay. Um, the more likely they're going to share that brainstorm or they're going to share that self-assessment or that peer review. Um, you know, so a lot of this, you know, this kind of big overview talk that we're, we're having today is really just how do we kind of lessen, you know, um, the fear of failure in our class, you know, and thinking about that of, of ways for students to really just jump in there, get messy, but still have a sense of, of where they are in terms of their performance in class. Uh, Monica's panels, Students use WhatsApp to send their eco-friendly routine. That's kind of cool. So yeah, you know, here's what I'm, here's what I do, or maybe it's a journal that they take of things they do. Um, I saw a really cool app once uh, that was made by some English language teachers, where uh, you could go out in in your environment and do little videos about you know environmentally friendly issues. Uh, so. Some of there where students became news reporters. They went out into their kind of community and talked about an environmental issue that was important to their community. Um, another quick one there, you know, gallery walk is a good one, right? So all these all these things um, that we can get students involved in, where there's up, they're moving around. And again, I've I've said this a few times now, and I'll say it one more time. Um, we've been doing these for a long time in language teaching. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of faculty from, you know, physics or, you know, uh, poetry, chemistry, you know, political science. Um, these are very new ideas for a lot of them. Um, and it's something that I think that we should be proud of as language teachers that we're often thinking about getting students up, getting students engaged, because language is inherently communicative. And so, you know, it involves action and involves activity in order to, to be successful at it. Um, you know, and this whole idea that we talk about with active learning, the, the gallery walks and the role plays and the panels, um, the whole purpose there is really to drive the retention of information. You know, if, uh, if students are engaged in active learning, they tend to remember, you know, 70 percent of what they say and write and 90 percent of what they do. So, um, you know, the more active we get, the more we can remember this information, share this information. 
and you know get them the opportunity to to practice uh you know practice skills solve problems struggle with complex questions propose solutions and explain ideas um, that you know cornell center for teaching innovation really kind of defines as active learning so you know pushing these things through and, and getting students um, really moving and engaged is is our real goal and so you know putting all the pressure on hota now but how we can do these things in a, in a practical you know in class way is is kind of the subject area for tomorrow a little bit of just how do we do this um starts to become the, the challenge right so i got the easy work hota's got the hard work uh and so you know i just wanted to kind of you know say thanks there and, and just throw it open um for ideas and discussions like what can we do with with this people have I ideas things they want to share examples that they may have i'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so we can chat thank you jeff i think um we all really enjoy it so if anyone have some questions please Jump in. Maybe we can start by putting the pressure on Hota. And so, you know, like with, with tomorrow, what can people kind of look towards? Um, well, it's going to be it's going to be a little bit uh, crazy. So we I mentioned the word mission. So teachers that attend the way the second part are going to have missions. Would you also mention about uh, different ways of solving a problem? So they are going to have different ways of solving a problem and, and do talk about learning goals and they're actually going to pick their goals. So I know we have teachers here that they teach at a university, uh, high school, and they, they teach kids. So we're going to work with the alternatives to, for kids and business uh, college students oriented to business uh, English. And the teachers are actually going to I'm going to guide them how to go from this backward design and we are going to end up with a lesson and we're going to cover a couple of technological tools that are going to solve one of the biggest issues when we talk a large class which you teach a large class which is basically what you were mentioning our people talk about role play class discussion and peer correction peer feedback but on an online setting even if we are six right now it's very difficult to actually have that discussion among two, like when you are in a classroom, like you can separate people in pairs or in groups and then you just walk around. But there is a, a tool, a web tool, and it's free. I'm not going to tell you which one now, that actually simulates that exact thing of walking uh, close to your students or, uh, or far from your students and start listening to them. So uh, if you want to know which one it is, uh, um just come come to the second part of, the, of this workshop <laughs> so we had a, a conversation over here in the chat so carmen brought up this idea of sketch noting and it was like well what's that i hadn't heard about it and so people are looking it up right now um we were asking earlier so they might know sketch noting sketch noting it's kind of like a, a visual note taking Cool. So I think, yeah, a few of us, uh, let's see, someone, Yvonne put in the link. There's a link in the chat there about like sketch noting. See, I love this idea where it's it's basically, you know, note taking, but with, with imagery and graphics. Um, as someone who's a very visual learner, this kind of speaks to me. Um, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, it's kind of really important that if a student, you know, does have challenges maybe just of, of always writing everything and trying to keep up being able to um write you know draw things and, and have that be accepted in the class as you know legitimate output towards you know their learning goals is really important um the one and only marcella raffo has posted in our chat and now i'm excited marcella says this is a question that diana posted in the event chat just in case Please let us know what active learning strategies do you use in your classroom most often? Um, for me, yeah, um, I do, you know, raft activities. Uh, I do case studies. Um, I do a lot of, um, I give students, I like to give students incorrect information. I love to give them the wrong answer 
and for them to have to try to figure out and explain to me why it's the wrong answer. Um, you know, I like to do things like that quite a bit. Um, those are mine. Anybody else like that? What are your favorite active learning strategies? Diana says active listening and active writing. So one thing I'm going to say as a teacher, I'm struggling with knowing when to shut up, you know, letting silence just be silent is a, this is, this is my thing I'm working on right now as an educator. So I'm just going to sit and be silent. Let the chat do its thing. Hey, yesterday, uh, Jackie Gardy and Dan Ryder talked about comics in the classroom. So Monica, you should definitely check out their session and look at um, comics in the classroom. It's a really good uh, resource for that. Uh, and, uh, and the recording is already in the replay. So if you want to check that session about comics, you can hit the replay section. We're going to have time for that too. Carolina says uncomfortable silence and Americans are terribly afraid of, of silence. We, it's just, we can't shut up. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Rachel says there's a, there's a session on silence tomorrow. So I'm going to attend. So anybody else have more questions? We are about to finish. Um, hello everyone. Um, I, I am a student. I am a, I am a teacher student in Atipna, uh, and and I am uh, right now in fourth, the fourth uh, level, and uh, I wanted to know. Uh, I am gonna. I'm gonna check out the the repetition, the, the recording of this session. It uh, seems to be it was. It seems like it was very interesting, but I wanted to know uh, a little about. If you could give me uh, an approach to what are uh, what are the best uh, ways to use apps in, in when when you are I mean, when you're in a class, what are the best apps I can use and in order to I like I mean create report and make them engage in class because I I know for you them in the internet because it's just about the it's just about researching a little bit but uh it's like i don't know um, if i can target their needs yeah, as well it's a really good question juan i think you know i maybe this isn't the answer you're you're hoping for but you know i always like to say um you know before i pick the technology it's what is it that what I want my students to do or learn um, and really kind of understanding that, you know, quickly, what is, what is the purpose of this activity? And then thinking about, you know, what are the tools that will help students reach that, that goal? So I might say, you know, this is a, a speaking activity. So what's an app that would maybe do transcription for my students or translation or um, give them a chance to kind of share ideas. And so, it's, it's always a really hard answer. And I think it's one of the, the big challenges when we talk about technology in the classroom, there's, there's no one answer for everybody. Um, you know, and often I think about, you know, one, what's the technology available to you? What's the technology available to your students? And then um, making the decision. There's actually a great article. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna take a screenshot of your, of your wand so I know who you are in the, and I'm going to send you a chat message. There's a great uh, article about, um, there's basically eight criteria for choosing technology in the classroom. And, you know, 
looking at those eight things to make a decision on what tool best fits you and your students, I'll send you the link to that article. You'll you'll love it. It's really good. Um, Carol Chappelle is the much. author of that. So, thank thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I I haven't I haven't had like uh, a classroom yet. It's like I have just a single student in my whole career. <laughs> it's I, I I've been studying you know like Vermont's mythology, but I was trained by uh, I don't know if you know that American English teacher is like an, a program uh, developed by the embassy here in Peru, and is uh, and um, although there were some teachers that uh, taught us. Um, we had a, like webinars every single uh, Wednesday, and and that's what my most of my knowledge came from. But uh, the thing is, I there are there are a lot of activities for children and for adults that can be modified and can be adapted for each one of those groups. But um, I, uh, as my 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 teacher also tells me that uh, you you can try to know what do they like so is is it good to make like a pool and because sometimes they don't know how to manage the technology as well as i do for example even though they are uh people from this century i mean from 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 this uh it's not like it's not like that old it's really young but they are they are still struggling with technology and that's the, that's some that's the difficultness that I find, and that may take some long time to, I mean, to fix. Yeah, and, and I, I know we're over time, but if, if we've got a few minutes, there's, um, you know, there's this conception of digital immigrants and digital natives, that young kids just get technology, and that's not true. You know, and actually, it can be a disservice to our students if we bring a technology into the classroom that they struggle with or they find challenging, because it hurts their performance. and. You know, um, something I think about where when I have my students write online, you know, write in a Google Doc, now typing is part of their assessment. How well they type suddenly becomes part of their grade because if they can't type very fast, their grade may be reduced, right? And so I think you bring up a really good point that, you know, pick the tools that you're comfortable with, pick the tools that your students are comfortable with. And then, you know, only if it helps, because if it doesn't help, then yeah, your students might get frustrated and suddenly, you know, they're not performing as well as they can. You know this stuff, Juan, you, you've got it. I, I, I really like the way uh, some teachers made me feel when they were teaching me. And, and I want to like imitate that in my own classes. And I, I just, I'm just trying to, to get that goal for, for us, for myself. And uh, and Dave, thank you very much for your time. I know it's your overtime, but I, I really appreciate your words. And I'm gonna be looking forward to receiving that uh, that article. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm typing and looking at the same time, but I'll, I'll dig it up for us and, and I'll share it with everybody. So, yeah, and, and thanks for, for coming today. I appreciate everybody's time and, and the conversation. So I'm looking forward to tomorrow too. Just I wanted to add just one thing. Uh, I I used a, a course here that is online and it's free. It's called Typing Club, and because you were you were uh, you were regarding uh, typing as a part of your grade, um, and this is the Typing Club was uh, it's like a course you can you can take by yourself. You just need to sing in and it it makes you write faster in your lab. It depends if you are using an English keyboard or a Spanish keyboard. It doesn't matter. I want to, I want to share it in the chat. Maybe some, someone is interested. Great. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Hota. And uh, thank you, everybody, to join us, for joining us. Um, we are at the end of our session. So we'll we we'll hope you to see you tomorrow with um, Hota's speak speech. So we'll we'll re really enjoy it. <laughs>